Everything Sequel is brought to you by Slater's 5050 and Brew Bar. The Everything Sequel podcast contains explicit language. You have been forewarned. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Everything Sequel Podcast, the Psycho Edition. You could have come and gone, if you ask me. My name is Michael Schantz of the How Dare You Awards. With me, in the tent, the make the makeshift tent, I'll call it, is Tom Stewart of Lonesome Whistle Productions. Say hello, Tom. I've had enough of this Nancy Drew horseshit from you. <laughs> Yeah, that was the line to pick, for sure. It was either that or Lit. there is no God. Oh, so, uh, well, hang on. I, <laughs> I, I got too excited there for a second. But, ladies and gentlemen, what Tom and I are talking about is the 1986 sequel, Psycho 3, directed by Anthony Perkins. Uh, Tom, this is a movie I could not find a budget for, but uh, in the USA and worldwide, it made just $14.4 million. To me, that says it's not as successful as Psycho 2, which made $34 million, I believe we said. So I think I'm right, right? This Psycho 2 is the good movie, and this is a bad movie. <laughs> right? No. The people have spoken. The people have spoken. $14.4 million. That's nothing. And they won't even tell us the budget because it was probably $50 million. You think they spent more on this than Psycho 2? It doesn't look like it, but... It doesn't look like it at all. <laughs> Are you insane? But let's talk about There Is No God, the very first line of the movie. My first note for this movie is that that line was apparently improvised. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think says a lot about the movie. It says a lot about what filming this movie must have been like if that was the first thing that popped out of the mind of one of the actors while <laughs> they're rolling. <laughs> all right, let's get into it. So for starters, if you all remember, I uh, ranked these sequels 2, 3, and 4, but Tom ranked them 3, 2, 4, so this is his favorite in the series. Yes. He's going to have to defend it. I still think it's a bad movie, though. Right. He, he thinks all three of them are bad. <laughs> I think three and four are bad, but I, you know, I also am like, I'm this close to saying good movies on these movies, even though I know I shouldn't, Tom, I almost yeah. can't help myself though. So knowing you, you, you've already <laughs> declared that, uh, when, when sequels try to do something radically different, that's what you like the most. And yet you picked Die Hard 2 as your favorite in that series. So seems like seems like you're not not sticking to your own guns there. But we'll keep it to... Oh, no, it did. Do, uh, in, in its defense and in mine, uh, Die Hard 2 is based on a, an original novel. Yeah. So it is doing something Get different. Get the fuck out of here. It's a total <laughs> retread. But... This movie uh, does try to do something different. Uh, one of my first notes is, wow, we, we got religious quick. Yeah, so I was kind of excited when I saw that the logo was in color, the Universal logo. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, great. So we're not going to start the movie with a mid-film scene from Psycho 2. Correct. Great. Um, not that we won't see it at some point. <laughs> we won't see it later on in the movie in black and yeah. white, which the Psycho Two is not. Um, and then, I, and then, but they they've left behind plagiarizing Psycho, but they've not left behind plagiarizing Hitchcock because yeah. th this this strongly resembles the ending of Hitchcock's Vertigo from nineteen fifty eight. Mm -hmm. Where a, you know, a woman accidentally falls from a um, from a bell tower in another. Correct, room. right. Um, so I was just like, okay, so you've you've switched up the movie, but you're still, you know, you're still uh, trading off uh, Hitchcock's legacy. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but then you know, I I then I sort of. So, okay, well, then it tries to move away from pastiche a little bit. 
um, into almost a kind of road movie spaghetti western territory for a little while. Yeah, it's really strange. Like, so for, for starters, um, <laughs> I have to imagine maybe there are people listening to this, Tom, who haven't seen Psycho 3. Um, and, and perhaps wouldn't expect an excommunicated nun walking across the Right. Street. So let me ask you this, because to me, there's a couple of things we have to deal with. One, this nun is responsible for another nun dying. Now, even though she didn't push her and it was an accident, I still think the police would be involved. It was, you know, it's, it's you know, manslaughter or depraved indifference, homicide or something. Like, I think this woman's going to jail and yet she's just excommunicated, kicked out. You killed a nun. Get out of here. You can't be a nun anymore. And the first thing she does is start walking across a desert. It's... It's, it's not like there's not going to really, be a, it's really very Yeah, strange. it's not like there's not going to be um, a road to that nunnery. Why not take the road somewhere? But she decides to get off the road and starts walking through the desert, which to me seems strange. Yeah, it's a, it's it's um it's an odd choice. But then of course she gets well, I don't want to say come up cuz it's, you know, nobody should have to deal with Jeff Fahey's character in this movie, but but that's what she gets for her choice. <laughs> Which one? Which character? Yeah, yeah. If you, oh, if you told me... At I'm the, so glad you said you, that. Because that's one of my notes. But go ahead. Go ahead. If you told me at the end of this movie that, you know, the plot twist of this movie surrounding... Uh, what's his name? Dwayne June, Dwayne Duke? Yeah, well, it's... His name is just... His name's Dwayne, but most people call him Duke. But he's listed... Okay. He's listed as Dwayne Duke, which... <laughs> doesn't make any sense but doesn't make any sense well it makes sense uh, if you if at the end of the movie the plot twist was this is like quintuplets <laughs> right identical twin quintuplets it it certainly has because that feeling he has so many different characters throughout the course of this movie in the one well life. we talked about in psycho 2 we talked about how at the end of psycho they seem to mention that he had split personalities but then we mentioned that it was really just a split. You know, there's Norman and then there's Mother. Because I don't think there's any other personalities. But Jeff Fahey, man, he's got... Mrs. Spool? Yeah, but I think, he, I think by the end of Psycho 2, she's become Mrs. Bates again. She's like, Spool's dead. Well, exactly, yeah. So, so... <laughs> But Fahey... That is a big problem, this movie, that he's carrying around... Mrs. Spool, not Mrs. Bates. And yet, Mrs. M is it mother talks with the voice of his aunt, not his mother. <laughs> That's a big problem. Well, then defend it. This is your favorite fucking movie. I mean... I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to somewhat defend it. I mean, I have to admit, when I saw the, and the credit that Anthony Perkins directed this movie... Right. I felt that kind of Superman 4 sinking <laughs> feeling upon seeing Christopher Reeve had contributed to, to the, the screenplay, story. right? Yeah, but I was actually pleasantly surprised. I mean, Anthony Perkins as a director, there's, there's two things about it which I think kind of work. One is that there's less Norman in the movie. We get a chance to focus on some new characters and develop some new characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I kind of like, you know, he had, he, when, when you're directing a movie, you tend to sort of become a supporting character rather than the lead, uh -huh. just because of the amount of work you have to do. Um, so I kind of like that. And I thought, you know, his hand's a little bit obvious as a director, but it, it, it sort of works. I mean, the, 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 I did the, feel... the shots of the bait, the shades, the shots of the Bates motel. Uh, I mean, it looks like, it looks like it's the first time he's ever picked up a camera and he's just like. Here's a shot of some tumbleweeds. Here's a shot of a, a can. Right, but they also, so, you know, they try to create some continuity between uh, the previous sequel and this one. There's the shot of the book, Belly of the Beast. And that's, that's a mm -hmm. book that Mary, the character of Meg Tilly, was reading in, in Psycho 2. Um, you see a shot of, strangely, I'll add, because we gave a lot of talk to the cleaning of murder scenes last episode, but there's a shot of the the uh, fruit cellar window with the sort of streaks <laughs> of the boy's hand on it 
when he was murdered, even though in Psycho 2, those streaks were cleaned, but they're back. So, yeah. you know, he's, you know, Anthony Perkins is trying to hearken back to this, uh, you know, the previous sequel. This movie takes place a month after the events of Psycho 2 uh, ended. And in regards to him as a director, he clearly wanted to pay homage to Hitchcock himself. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much Hitchcock in it. Without having a silhouette of Alfred Hitchcock in the movie, as in the previous one. Correct. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we want to do a li- just just short of that. Just short of it. Um, but I also, and also felt... saying in the, in, in the previous movie, in the credits, it said we, we'd like to express a, a debt to Alfred Hitchcock. And I don't know if that was just them trying to get in front of lawsuits or bad reviews. I don't it's hard know to say. It's hard to say. I'll admit. But I'll say this. Anthony Perkins himself, after this movie finished, he said he felt like he was not up to to directing Mm. and he felt like he didn't do a good job. Now, all the actors really seemed to like working with him and the director. And it shows. Yeah. And the director of photography, specifically not knowing how Anthony Perkins would be as a director, he said, have you had any ideas about how you're blocking this shot for one of the first shots they were going to do? And Anthony Perkins was completely on the ball about, no, this is what we're going to happen. And like, these are the lights I want. and These are the lenses I want. And so the director of photography, like, never had to ask him another question again. So it felt like he was up to the task. But yeah, it's very competently um, directed. One of the things that imagistically this brings back from the original that they completely forgot about in Psycho 2 is that Norman likes to stuff birds and yeah. them around his house. Right. And well, I, I almost crossed my mind if they got to, they fit just, you know, they just wrapped on Psycho 2 and then they, they just went, Oh no! Oh, the birds! <laughs> we forgot the birds. We're gonna have to make another film that is predominantly about stuffed birds. Well, I I got the sense that in Psycho Two, you literally watch Norman walk out of the courtroom after a judge saying, "Yeah, you're good now." So, um, and and then you know he 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 takes ten steps into his house. He's hearing mom's voice again. Yeah. He goes. He starts working at a diner that day. Mm-hmm. So I felt like there just wasn't enough time for Norman to take up his hobby because he was uh, questioning his own sanity. But after he was able to kill his real mother and stuff her, he was like, "Oh my God! I forgot how much I love stuffing birds." So it's a month later. I've had plenty of time to stuff some more birds, and that's how I took it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I. I. I... I absolutely agree, and he is, he is... It all full, seemed perfectly... On, that table is covered in fucking birds. Oh, yeah, there's there are birds everywhere. He's killing them in large numbers and stuffing them on the kitchen table. I remember thinking, uh, because you see a dead bird on the ground, and then you see two birds eating, and then they go on the ground, and I'm like, oh, they see their friends dead. And then um, the shot pans up or something like that, and you see feet walking in, and it pans back, and the other two birds are dead. And I, wait, what happened? And I went, oh, yeah, yeah poison. All right. Well, that's where we're going, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you, you, you mentioned that uh, for some reason I thought this was seven months after the events of Psycho no. 2. No, just, just one, one month, month after okay. 2 ends. Well, that wasn't made clear. Um, maybe I, I thought that because everyone, is, when we get to Statler's Diner, where they're still talking about the disappearance of Norman's real mother, Mrs. Spool. Right. Everyone I love has that put the band... a lot of weight in that last month. Yeah. <laughs> I love that the band is back, though. I love that everybody's back. The terrible cop from Cobra is back. Um... You know, the waitress, uh, the the cook is back. Yeah, everybody's there. Yeah, let's talk about that sheriff. He is the, the I've said this in the last podcast, but he is the, the number one worst police officer in cinema history. He, he is so certain of Norman's innocence, despite the fact he has been the center of every murder in his precinct for the past year. Not to mention putting bloody ice in his own mouth. 
absolutely. And and to cap that all off, when he finally does cap, spoiler alert, when he cap, finally does arrest Norman, he allows him to get into the police car with a severed arm. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, th- there's... It, um, it's one of those, you know, I, well, we're skipping to the, to the last seconds of this movie, but he pulls out that severed hand and pets it, you know, like, remember the Bugs Bunny cartoons with, you know, this is my brother, George, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> that's what it reminded me of. Isn't there a Woody of. Woodpecker cartoon in this film as well? There might be. There, so let me ask you this. Uh, in terms of the direction by Anthony Perkins, he did some interesting stuff with transitions. Uh, people are watching a television with a cartoon. We go to him watching that same cartoon in his yeah. house. He closes a door to I can't remember where and then, you know, somewhere outside of the Bates home. And then he turns around and he's in the Bates home. Stuff like that. Yeah, he, I thought that was interesting. He's got a good, you know... He, he, he could put some of this on as real. He's got a good kind of like grasp of cinematic yeah. language. What they say, uh, uh, have a good yeah, eye. He, 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 um, he does kind of have a good eye. And, and, and I think there are some kind of visual tricks in this movie that he pulls off really well. The, one of my favorite moments, well, of any of these terrible, terrible sequels is that, um, <laughs> is when you think that there's a there's a person in behind a shower curtain and it turns out just to be a dress hanging up and that kind of stuff that kind of you know like basic you know uh like film it's it's film trickery you know film is magic kind of stuff he right pulls off pretty well um i can't say the same about the purple lamp sex scene i don't know what to make of that hang on because we got a lot to talk about we're just getting started but i don't know what to make of it all right we're gonna take a quick break everybody and then you're gonna find out what tom means when he says purple lamps just know that it involves jeff fahey yep we'll be back right after this (laughs) Look, people, we're living in strange times. We know that, don't we? Of course we do. People don't even know what to do with themselves. We're getting stir crazy. Well, get outside and get yourself some great food, I say. You need to go to Slater's 5050 and Point Loma's Liberty Station. It's time to treat yourself to booze, to beer, to burgers, and more. They have their full menu, people. Their full menu, I say. How many restaurants do you know that are doing that? Most places are doing a quarter of their menu, probably. Some might be doing a half. Maybe a few have got three quarters of a menu. But Slater's 5050 has their full menu, including their signature 5050 patty. It's half ground beef. It's half ground bacon. It's 100% delicious. What more could you possibly ask? Worried about social distancing? Well, it is in place, people. Tables are separated and the staff will always be seen wearing masks. You're out of excuses. Get off your keister and come on down to Liberty Station's own Slater's 5050. Indoor dining available. Outdoor dining available. Bring the family. Bring your dog. Come enjoy the normal again. Good day to you. I said good day. And we're back. We're here talking about uh, the 1986 Anthony Perkins directed sequel of Psycho 3. We left you with The Purple Lamps. So, Tom, let me backtrack a little bit. (laughs) Yes. Because we already talked about the multiple personalities of Jeff Fahey in this movie. From the moment you see Jeff Fahey in this movie, well, first first of all, this is one of those movies where I constantly wanted to come up with my own lines. Mm. Um, he he picks up the character of, um, what's her name, Maureen Coyle? Yeah. The the nun. Maureen, yeah. And, and uh, the nun is played by Diana Scarwood, by the way, who's an Oscar nominee for a movie called Inside Moves. <laughs> Thank, thanks for that trivia. Just, just a little bit of trivia and, uh, for you. I will, anyway, I will uh, forgetting that. File three, it away. Two, one, it's gone. 
<laughs> all right, fine. I'm just saying there's an Oscar nominee in this movie. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Jeff Fahey picks her up, and the first thing he says or asks is car trouble, and I desperately wanted her to say, no, killing a nun trouble. <laughs> That, that, that's what I wanted her to say desperately. Um, and, and so they say at, show at any rate, tell. And, <laughs> and you scoffed at my big knife line from Psycho 2. <laughs> You're right. All right. I'll shut no, up. No, not but, at all. Um, no. uh, yeah. I, you know. So this guy is introduced as a stone cold rapist. Right, exactly what I was going to say. I mean, so they why are we have to park with him for the rest of the movie. Is what for I mean. the rest of the movie. So they park the car, he starts trying to kiss her, and she and she clearly is not interested, and his line is, "What's the problem?" As though, you know, the problem is you're raping me. Yeah. You fucking asshole. So and it, you know, I think it's strange that we start with him there and then we get to what seemingly should be his dream woman because mm. he meets a stone cold freak yeah some woman that's willing to strip for him while he's completely buck naked shining the purple lamps on her and she's taking off her clothes and licking naked pictures of women that are stuck to the wall yeah i mean it does fit in with yeah as that scene confused me. I didn't know whether I was supposed to be turned on. I don't know whether... Oh, God, I hope not. They were supposed to be turned on by any of this either. Right. Like, I didn't know what kind of voyeurism was going on here. It was strange. The purple and pink are predominantly the colors of this movie, so that wasn't surprising. He, here's my theory, okay? And I need to take you back to Psycho 2. Okay. The person. <laughs> okay. When you get to uh, the end credits of Psycho 2, under Best Boy <laughs> is a person called Michael Orifice. This is 100% true. Michael Orifice is the best boy on Psycho 2. Go on. <laughs> I didn't know what that job was. Now I think I do. <laughs> Oh, fuck. When it comes to Psycho 3, we see the return of Michael Orifice. And guess what his job is now? He's been promoted. Guess what his job is? <gasps> Associate producer. Lamp operator. <laughs> and this sex scene involves two large lamps with purple light bulbs. Wow. I think we've solved it, Mike. I think we've solved it. Man. That's the only rationale I have behind that scene. But yeah, just going back to the way that uh, Dwayne or Duke, or whatever the fuck he's called, <laughs> personality changes over the course of the movie. Like, I, I didn't know what the movie was trying to say about him. Uh, it's like that he's that he's a version of Norman. He's what Norman could be if he didn't try and stop himself. Like... It's like some people are worse than some people are worse than Norman, even though society thinks they're better than them. Right. Like, w it's I like I didn't get what the what the tone was there. Well, and what so later on in the movie he starts he starts kind of like becoming a he's like the devil on the shoulder or like Norman's libido. He's like literally standing at his shoulder, going, "You should totally get this woman," and that right. kind of thing. But that's the only function I, uh, the only clear function of him in the movie. The rest of the time is just like nonsense jumps in characterization. And what's strange, like, I have to take into consideration that this movie is directed by Anthony Perkins. So mm -hmm. what's he trying to say about this character? Yeah. And also, I, I, you know, is there anything to the idea that Anthony Perkins himself was gay? And is this his idea of the rest of us? Wow. Okay. Wow, you know. Wow. Yeah. Are we that? That's 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 so interesting. Like, 
that's really interesting. Be- not not in terms of this movie because I, you, you just said it perfectly there. But when one of the things I wanted to talk about when it comes to Psycho Four, and I'll just briefly mention it here, is how homophobic a movie, un, you know, unprompted homophobia in that movie. Yeah, right. And it's interesting that in this movie, it's like heterophobia. I mean, it's just strange, like the degree to which. Duke is toxic is, uh, I mean, alarming, fucking alarming. He is not a person I want to meet ever. Yeah, I think, I think sadly, I mean, a lot of these things are are, are great, but I think a lot of, and Jeff Fahey is phenomenal. Oh yeah. I love, I love him as an actor. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to confusion and accidental ambiguity from bad writing of characters. <laughs> Possibly. I just think that, that ba- I think basically they want they want someone to serve they want a male character who serves certain different purposes in the parts of the film and somebody had the bright idea of making it all one character without right. thinking Yeah, it's like know. he's an amalgam of a couple of characters or three characters, right? Yeah, I mean I think the, the 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 roadside rapist guy should have been someone totally different mm-hmm. than then right than Duke than that Duke character Kaboom whatever his name is. Duke Kaboom <laughs> it's, it's the name of Keanu Reeves' character in Toy Story Four he's probably not called Duke Kaboom is he du- Dwayne Duke Dwayne Dwayne Duke du- yeah done and done mm-hmm. well to me and I God knows why I'm sticking not sticking up for the character but like i just remember you know you have this young beautiful woman who's trying to get norman to get involved in a three-way with her and fahey that's Mm -hmm. at least what it seems like she seems like a stone cold freak which basically would seem like the dream woman for duke he gets you know and then the second she's she's in his room and they've had a little hanky panky he's like get the fuck out and I'm like, Duke, you just ruined it. She's your dream girl. What What's the matter with you? You guys should be walking down the aisle together, buddy. I guess they introduced the idea quite early on in the movie that if he has a, a, a character goal, like if he's goal-oriented in any way, which I don't know if he is, well, it's yeah. that he wants to corrupt Norman. He wants to bring Norman... It's a, it's a, it's like almost like a replay of the gaslighting in the second film. It's like, right. I got this guy's number. He's pretending to be something he's not. I'm going to make him what he really is. Well, and let's save it for a little bit later for how far he'll go with that. Because by the end, he goes to jumps to another level of character where I am just left baffled. But yeah. before we get there, um, you know, this is your favorite in the series stop saying that (laughs) i'm gonna keep saying it we we talked at length in the last one about uh how much i like psycho 2 and how much you think i shouldn't and during that episode you asked me about anthony perkins performance and i'm gonna throw that at you now because one of my biggest notes in this movie is that his performance seems completely wooden to me um yes i th- i think i think it's it's partly a it's partly a, a byproduct of how he's kind of reduced his role in in the movie that he's just kind of like he's just become sort of a given and i think he's onto a good idea which is let's make this movie about something else something other than norman about people other than Norman. Yeah, but it, like, actively stuck out to me that he was just sort of saying his lines like this. And a boy's best friend is his mother. I mean, he sounds yeah, robotic. I, 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 yeah, I mean, I think the maybe the problem with Psycho 2 is there's too much melodrama in his performance, so maybe this, he he's trying to be more low-key and it's actually not working. It's just making him look kind of wooden. I think he's, I think part of it is there's a sense that Norman is now, and this is something that I did kind of like. I mean, this is why, for so many reasons, this should have been set 
contemporaneously with 1986. It should have been three years later for so many reasons. Uh huh. Instead of a month, I thought it was seven months. Apparently, it's a fucking month, which is even <laughs> crazier than I thought. Um, because there's a sense that, oh, you, like you were saying earlier, Norman's settled in. He's finally in a place in his life where he's like, he's like the, you know, the, the lead character in his own sitcom. He's like, he's right. going, he's <laughs> like, other people are coming into the hotel. He's taught, you know, he's interacting with them. So I think they're trying to get this idea of like, he's in his happy place. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's nothing terribly interesting about that. Uh, one where one area where I think, and I guess he's the director of the movie, so it's his fault. Uh, we talked when we when we talked about Jaws two. We talked about how you know one of the strengths of Jaws is you never hardly ever see the shark. Jaws two, that shark is everywhere. Yeah, right. Um, and here it's kind of like Hitchcock was trying to keep the image of Norman dressed as his mother. Yeah, purposely abstract, but here. For the first it's time, everywhere. You get a clear image of that, of him walking around using his mother's voice. Dread. You you kind of see it clearly. Kitchcock was always trying to keep it really vague, so, so you never quite saw it. So this is sort of like, well, it's just pulling away the curtain, and it's like, it, it's just a guy. Now it's just a guy in a wig. Yeah, like community theater. Well, let me ask you this because the reveal of that uh, towards the end of the movie, you know, I mean, like the the real kind of close up shot on his face. You remember yeah. that? And he's kind of, his mouth is kind of agape. And I, I thought it was so interesting because for a half a second, that shot is very scary. Yeah. But it lingers on him and yeah. it becomes comical. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's like, it's sort of like, I mean, I thought they were just going to straight plagiarize it and have him turn into his mother. I like that it doesn't go that far. It resists turning him into his mother. But what it replaces it is, like you say, is comical. Yeah. And doesn't add anything. Um, he's like, in ex he's in basically, we, I mean, this is a thing that a lot of the, th a lot of uh, third movies in the series do. It's like a Psycho 2 reset us to the original because he he's walking around. The Psycho 2 reset us to before the beginning of Psycho mm -hmm. because he's walking around with his corpse mother in his arms. Whereas Psycho 3 ends, it ends and it where Psycho the movie ends with him being taken away into incarceration. Right, right. Inhabited by his mother. Um, so... I'm not saying I like any of those choices, but uh, they are choices. <laughs> but again, you're supposed to like it when uh, they do shit differently. And in this movie, we have the same exact ending. And clearly, Anthony Perkins as a director either wants to pay homage to or is infatuated, is what it seemed like to me, with Alfred Hitchcock himself. Um, there are so many shots that are... I mean, just direct pulls from the original Psycho in this movie. Yeah. Um, None of it bothers you, though? Uh, yeah, it bothers me. I don't think this is a good movie. Right, I right, think, right. I mean, I guess it's more... Um, maybe it was just the relief of having, like, straightforward storytelling. There was no big... You know, they didn't need to retcon anything to make any of this movie happen. You know, we were we were sort of just carrying on and telling a story. We were telling a story about other people, which I guess is the big difference that, you know, Psycho 2, there's not really any new characters in any, who are crucial in any way, who aren't like the daughters, or, you know, who aren't like the offspring of characters from, from the, the original, original movie. All right. Um, whereas this is like, you, you've got these compl these characters who, and you know one of the one of the nice variations is you know this movie is about Catholicism, which is interesting because Hitchcock's Catholicism is often talked about in terms of his movies, like what the Catholic themes and imagery he's bringing to his film. So that's quite a subtle way of bringing Hitchcock into it without plagiarizing his work, because you, you're relating this idea of 
his mother fixation to like the Virgin Mary and and you, Christian theology. You think so that I thought that was an so this film is kind of doing some things differently, sometimes bafflingly. Right. Um, you think that, but, couple- but it does. You know, at times it is more egregious in its plagiarism. They recreate the murder of Arbogast. Yeah. Um, right. Martin Balsam, and somehow. I mean, that special effect looked terrible in 1960. It looks even worse now. Yeah, it did look worse. You're right. I don't know how that's possible. This is 1986. So, um, and, but do you think that reference to the Catholicism, that was intentional? Well, yeah. I mean, she's a nun. There's a point at which... No, I mean... One of the... I mean, do you think it was conscious of, like, well, you know, uh, uh, Hitchcock was... A Catholic, and so I want to bring in this Catholic angle. I think enough time has passed and enough has been written about Hitchcock in the... If this had been like in 1965, maybe not. But because it's 1986 and because there has been... You know, Hitchcock is is such such a disgust figure. I think it's there. Okay. I mean, the, the next movie certainly is... Is a very educ. It's a very film savvy, film educated take on the psycho films, and I think you know. And Anthony Perkins has been around long enough in the industry. I think it's probably purposeful, whether or not it, whether or not it is. I think it works. Um, there's a great one of my favorite moments in the movie is where uh, Norman gets ready to do another shower scene murder. Right. Except this time it's the bath, so it's different. <laughs> and. Um, in her deluded, fucked up state, uh, Maureen thinks it's the Virgin Mary visiting him in a vision. Visiting right. her in a vision. Yeah. And I love, I love. I that. did I like that I moment. That is a great bait and switch. Yeah. No, that it's was like, great. We, it's like you're gonna do, like the bath version of the shower scene, but instead you go completely in another direction, and he becomes like the savior, not the the salvation, not the uh, not, the damnation. Not the, yeah, exactly. All right, well, uh, we're going to take one more quick break, and then we'll finish up talking about Psycho 3. Stay tuned. We'll be back right after this. If you're anything like me, you spend the majority of the day wondering whether you want coffee, beer, or wine. Whichever way you fall, Brew Bar has you covered. Located in the heart of 3rd Avenue Village in glorious downtown Chula Vista, California, which is also my neck of the woods, Brew Bar is a coffee shop, bar, and eatery rolled into one delightful package. Tim and Alex run the place, and let me tell you listeners, these guys know their coffee. And after you've been in their company, so will you. They turned me on to pour over, and it's literally all I drink now. If for some crazy reason you don't want to try the best coffee in the world, they've got espresso drinks, all kinds of teas, and even coffee cocktails. You heard me. Coffee tails. And we're just getting started. Bottle service on craft beer and wine, alcoholic and caffeinated potions, an all-day food menu with plenty of vegan options. All served up in an atmosphere hip enough to know you're getting the best quality, but not too hip that you feel the need to drive to 7-Eleven and get a bucket of brown swill. Brew Bar. It's the best place to be for beer, wine, coffee and tea. And if you go, you might even see me. And we're back. We're here talking about Psycho 3, 1986, directed by Anthony Perkins, Tom... Uh, we're getting to the end of it here, so let me ask. Well, first of all, I want to I want to ask your opinion about something I caught from the beginning of this movie. I don't even know her name. What's the character of the reporter's name? Do you remember? I just kept putting reporter. Okay, so the reporter. She's just an exposition. Yeah, and, and she's an exposition dump. But I found I did find this interesting because this movie's made in 1986, and we're clearly in Ronald Reagan's America. And yeah. it's this idea where she sits down with um, Norman in the diner to start complaining that he was released from the mental hospital. And mm-hmm. it's this uh, tough on crime kind of idea. And so you could see there's a direct parallel to her view of how we should consider criminals. Although, you know, in her defense, Norman was a murderer. 
<laughs> it's not like somebody who just was smoking pot. Um, she's she's kind of filling in the gaps that the sheriff refuses to ignore. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, so anyway, I just found it interesting. I just love it when you watch movies and you can kind of date them in that way where yeah. you see a political kind of bent behind uh, what, you know, what some characters are talking about. Although, again, and we talked about this with Psycho 2, um, this question of rehabilitation versus incarceration, I don't think the series is, uh, has yet figured out where it stands on Yeah, this. that's true. Because you're absolutely right. When the reporter comes in and she she's basically, you know, voicing Reaganite policy... Uh, on on law and order <laughs> um but then later on in the movie there's a line where norman says you know conservative never goes out of fashion right and it's like oh so we're blaming you know conservative conservatism sexual repression as well uh -huh. it's like again it's like who who's really to blame here it's a, it's also it's like it, it it ties into how we feel about duke and, you know, how we feel about the porn that he puts up on his walls. Uh -huh. You know, I remember seeing that and thinking, like, what is this? You could almost hear... Anti is this anti-porn because it's associated with Duke? Right. Or, you know, but you could, is it like... You could almost hear a politician saying, I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. And that's <laughs> it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, I just I just sort of wonder if I mean I think we've eased off a little of the I mean remember in Psycho Two we have a couple of kids smoking weed having sex gotta die and they're murdered murdered by Mrs. Mrs. Did Mrs. Spool murder yes, them? Yes, I, I think know. so. Mrs. Spool murdered them, and that's like that's a kind of you know that kind of conservatives punishing permissive behavior here. Like I, I don't, I don't get that same sense that we're, we're kill, we're punishing people in the same no. way. No, yeah, you're right, and it even the fact that the fact that Duke even gets to be even gets any kind of, you know, like the fact that he's even considered in the movie shows that we're we're supposed to be quite forgiving to the worst possible people. Yeah, and let's get back to Duke because that character jump. You know, his his not multifaceted, but multi personality character, uh, he really goes off the bend because by the end of this movie he is kissing the spool corpse. To 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 get a rise to out get a rise out of Norman and kind of blackmail him. I, I you know I guess blackmail goes to his earlier character, but he seems unhinged in the way that Norman never seemed to go. You know, I mean he he literally went b a n a n a s. He 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 did. I mean it's yeah. I I agree. It's it's like. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know what they're they're trying to do with this character. I think when when you, I kind of blocked that out. But now now that you mention that, I do think ultimately what they're going is for is like there are worse things in the world than Norman Bates. You know, that there's some. That's it's like this is really fucked up behavior. Right. I mean, this guy's this guy's keeping his mother's corpse, corpse or mother or aunt or who the fuck ever a corpse in his basement. But this guy's kissing the girl. Yeah, he's fucked up. Norman just wants to um, take, uh, you know, Mama's hand and pet it. And, I, you know, one of, the, one of the things, I have a theory that, you know, if horror, specifically about the horror genre, if horror franchises go on long enough, even if they don't start off with the supernatural, the supernatural will eventually happen at some point. And here we have a, a very generous nod to that. Which is a moment at which the um, Mrs. Bates or Mrs. Spool's corpse seems to point uh -huh. at uh, Duke. Right. So this is, and this is the first time we've considered the idea that um, she's not just a corpse; she's a she's not just a corpse, and, and Norman's not just ventriloquizing her; that she's got some supernatural agency. And I just think that's something that if you have enough 
movies in the horror genre that will eventually happen. Uh, yeah, right. Like, by osmosis. Yeah, it just has to happen. You know, you'll run out of so many ideas that this will be the only route left to you. Well, all I know is that for me, Duke went so crazy at the end that he was bananananananas. I mean, he went extra bananas. He sure did. And, I mean, I kind of like, I liked the, um, I like this, if there is a surprise twist in this film, it's that instead of killing the reporter, whatever her name is, um, <laughs> Norman turns around and kills his mother again. Right. Um, and, you know, rids her from his consciousness. But he's not just killing everything, the corpse. Everything but her arm. Is now yeah, his, it, he's not know. just killing the corpse. He's he's killing the voice inside of himself. Right. And that does feel and like where this has, movie like, is supposed to go. Right? Yeah, and I was like, I kind of like that as a, as a choice because I was genuinely surprised. I didn't think they were going to do that. But I didn't think they were going to do that because it fucks them for another second. Right, sequel. right. <laughs> so I'm like, in the end, it's a dick move. <laughs> Um, yeah, and it kind of leaves us nowhere to go for pitch a sequel. So we'll see what happens when we do that. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that's it, Tom, for Psycho 3. I don't have anything else left. Yeah, let's move, let, let's move on. <laughs> I've, defend, I've done as much defending as I can do. You've done all you can do. <laughs> to no avail, I say. Psycho 2 all the way. All right, la hey. ladies and gentlemen, that's it for Psycho 3. For Tom Stewart, my name is Michael Schantz. Uh, we're going to catch you next time, and we'll be talking about Psycho 4. The beginning! The beginning. See you then. <laughs>